because I've had so many legal talks today. <laughs>
Now let's welcome Brian. Hi. Um, can you confirm whether the second talk is or is not in fact happening? It is happening. We have uh, uh, two speakers here. Yeah, We're talking about the same topic. Some sort of protest on its, um, on its description page. But um, there is somebody no, it is. It is. We have. Uh, yeah, uh, the is uh, that uh, the person uh, which was supposed to, uh, to speak uh, decided not to come. Uh, the reason uh, I, I didn't really understand his, uh, his point, uh, but uh, he was not uh, happy with the fact that uh, you were going, he was asked to uh, pay uh, for attending uh, even if he was a speaker. And uh, okay, it's uh, as a point of. Uh, but it's happening, so so we'll see you later. Okay, so now let's get started. Let's welcome Brian here, who will be speaking about the URAA. Uh, so I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I was originally supposed to give this talk to Diana from the legal department at the foundation, uh, but she ended up being a little bit overbooked for Wikimania, uh, so she kind of ditched me and left me to do it on my own, but that's okay, I think I can handle it okay. way. Um, so basically, today I'm going to be talking about the URA. Uh, if you're at Con Commons, you probably already know a little bit about it. Uh, it's been like a big point of contention, especially in the past year. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, kind of give an overview of what the history and, and what maybe some potential solutions are. Uh, but before I talk about the URA itself, uh, I wanted to give you guys some of the history behind it. Uh, because even though this law wasn't passed until 1994, uh, it was actually um, basically arose because of events that happened over 100 years earlier. So in order to stay, understand where the law comes from, uh, we actually have to go all the way back to the 19th century and look at what the situation was there and the events that led up to what we what the current situation is. Um, so let's look at how copyright law looked before uh, 1886. Um, so first of all, each country then had completely different copyright laws. Uh, some of them were based on the death of the author, some of them were based on the time since publication, some of them were 10 years, some of them were 20 years, some of them were 50 years. Uh, and there was no synchronization at all between any of these laws. Uh, secondly, uh, foreign works were not entitled to copyright protection. Uh, in other words, France only protected French authors, Germany only protected German authors, the US only protected American authors, etc. Um, and so basically this meant that piracy was actually legal so long as you were only pirating foreign works. Uh, and as transportation between countries became cheaper and faster, uh, it became more and more common for contemporary works to be pirated in other countries. Uh, in fact, in some countries, such as the Netherlands, many of the publishing companies primarily made money through unlicensed reproductions and translations of foreign works. Uh, so eventually, this became so common that writers started complaining about it. So for example, every time Victor Hugo would travel abroad, he would see uh, a bunch of unlicensed translations of his poetry, and he would get pretty upset about this. Number one, because the translations were usually pretty poor quality, and number two, because he wasn't getting any money from the people that were publishing them. So Victor Hugo and some other writers got together, and they decided that they wanted to do something about it. Uh, so what they did is they actually formed a small association called the Association Literaire et Artistique Internationale. Sorry, it must be French. I'll just call it the ALAI. Um, so this was founded in 1878 in Paris. Victor Hugo was the founder and president of it initially. Uh, and its pretty much uh, only goal was to create an international convention for the protection of copyright. Um, and this, this organization is actually even still active today. In fact, they, they even published uh, an analysis of Creative Commons licenses a few years ago. Um, but anyway, let's go back to the 19th century. Uh, so back in the 1880s, the ALAI began lobbying hard for copyright reform. They organized conferences, they published position papers, they started media campaigns, and gradually they started convincing the world that the publishing and writing industries were in danger of being killed by piracy. Uh, all of which may sound familiar if you were alive at all in the past decade. <laughs> so the result of uh, this, uh, this group was that they decided to have a convention, uh, 
result is that, well, the, the result of their lobbying was they convinced the countries uh, in Europe and a few elsewhere to have a convention to uh, suss out the copyright laws. Um, and this was actually, uh, the Berne Convention was actually the world's very first international copyright treaty. Uh, so I'm going to go over a few of the things that were in the Berne Convention. Uh, first, the main thing was that it standardized copyright terms across the countries that were parties to the convention. Um, and the terms that they enacted was the life of the author plus 50 years, uh, or you actually had the option of doing more than 50 years if you wanted, but the minimum was it had to be life plus 50 years. Uh, the second point was that all of the countries had to grant copyrights to works that were created by the other countries that were parties to the convention. Uh, and finally, um, all of the copyrights were granted automatically, uh, so you didn't have to have any kind of copyright registration, you didn't have to put a copyright notice. Um, it, basically, like as soon as anything was in fixed, tangible form, it was copyrighted. Uh, and then also, uh, translations had to be licensed, which was uh, kind of a new concept then. And obviously, this is something that made Victor Hugo very happy. Um, so, in 1886, when this treaty was signed, uh, there were actually initially only 10 countries that were parties to it. Um, even though, it, it, you know, if you know anything about the Berne Convention, you know that now it pretty much covers the entire planet. Um, so back then, we had Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, Tunisia, which was uh, a colony of France, the United Kingdom, and inexplicably, Haiti and Liberia. Uh, the United States, Japan, and several Latin American countries were also invited, but none of them were interested in joining the convention. Uh, one of the main reasons that the U.S. didn't want to join is because they would have had to basically completely gutted their existing copyright laws and changed them completely. Uh, at, at the time, the U.S. actually had fairly same copyright policies. Uh, for example, their law was that uh, once something was copyrighted, it was copyrighted for 28 years, and then you could apply to renew it for another 14 years. Uh, and no copyright was granted on any works unless they were uh, unless they followed a series of formalities. Uh, like they, it had to say copyright whatever year it was, um, and then it, uh, you had to register it and then apply for a renewal. So it was a very official process that you know most people who were just creating ephemeral works didn't bother going through. Um, so let's see. So even though the U.S. wasn't interested in joining the Berne Convention, they were still interested in increasing copyright protections. In fact, over the next few decades, the copyright terms in the U.S. had extended 11 separate times. And by 1976, they were basically on par with the minimum requirements in the Berne Convention, with the exception of automatically granting copyrights. So finally, in 1988, the U.S. decides to join the convention um, after, I mean, it's been like a, a hundred years of lobbying, so it took quite a while, but they finally did it. Um, and it, they, they decided to drop all of the formality requirements, which was one of the, one of the conditions of joining the convention. Um, and in exchange, the U.S. gains recognition uh, of their of copyrights by American authors, by all the other countries that are in the Berne Convention. Uh, but there's one slight issue with it, um, and that's that in the, the Implementation Act that was passed by Congress, it actually fails to satisfy a particular article of the Berne Convention. Um, and that article was the retroactivity clause, which said, um, you know, now that you're joining the Berne Convention, you have to retroactively grant all these copyrights that you had been denied previously. Um, so, after a whole bunch of complaints uh, from various European countries, um, the U.S. Uh, enters the Uruguay Round of Agreements, uh, which is a uh, it's basically like a, uh, another round of free trade agreements that have been going on at the time. Um, they were all negotiated in secret closed door sessions. And this was actually a very wide-ranging uh, negotiation, and the main thing that came out of it was the formation of the World Trade Organization. Uh, there were actually 123 different countries involved, um, and each one was, was called a contracting party because they were contractually obligated to implement these laws back in that country. Um, and one of the conditions of uh, the agreement was that they would all implement uh, the conditions of the Berne Convention, with the exception of moral rights, uh, because mainly because in the U.S. they were only interested in economic rights and didn't have any interest in moral rights. Uh, so what happened basically is that uh, after a hundred years of holding out, the U.S. finally bargained away its public domain, at least for foreign works. Uh, and this is actually a quote, a contemporary quote uh, 
from an internal U.S. Trade Representative strategy document uh, from, uh, from right before uh, when the representatives were going into the neg negotiations. Um, it's kind of telling, and I mean, actually like bargaining away the public domain was the least of the crimes that happened during the Uruguay round of agreements, but it was one of the things that they did bargain away, unfortunately. Um, so now I'll, I'll give you a little bit of information about the URA itself. Um, so the, the Uruguay Round Agreements Act, which was the actual law that was passed by Congress in 1994, uh, was the act that implemented the agreements that were agreed to at the negotiations. Uh, it was submitted under special, special fast track procedures, uh, which basically means that there were no modifications allowed by Congress. There was basically no discussion whatsoever. Uh, it was basically just pushed through as it was received. Uh, and then it was signed into the law only eight months after the agreements were made. Um, and so the main thing that this did as far as uh, copyright was it brought the U.S. into compliance with Article 18. So what does the URA actually do? It retroactively grants copyright protection to foreign works that did not follow U.S. copyright formalities, um, which basically includes pretty much all foreign works that were created in the 20th century, because uh, most foreign works did not include the like copyright symbol 1990 whatever uh, because that that's not a convention that was followed in most other countries um, and of course you know most foreign authors were not interested in registering with the U.S. Copyright Office or doing renewals or anything like that. Uh, so a few examples of some works that were affected by this retroactive copyright grant um, and this I mean there were millions of works this is just a very small sampling. Uh, this Fritz Lang's Metropolis, Lord of the Rings, M.C. Escher, Igor Stravinsky. Picasso, Mahatma Gandhi, all these things. Um, and so at the time that this happened, you know, it was, it was actually kind of controversial in the US because all these high school teachers who had been teaching Stravinsky to their students suddenly couldn't do that without paying a licensing fee. Um, but, you know, so what ended up happening was there was a court case called Golan versus Holder that ended up going to the Supreme Court. Uh, various parties such as the EFF and the Wikimedia Foundation filed amicus briefs um, opposing uh, the law, and but unfortunately, the Supreme Court ruled six to three that the law was constitutional, even though it was basically screwing most of the American public over with no real benefit. Uh, but they said there was nothing un nothing unconstitutional about it. Um, so now we're stuck with it, and we have to deal with it. So um, if, you're, if you've been on Commons and you followed any of the discussions about the URA and the files that are affected by it. Um, you might be aware that figuring out if the URA applies to particular media is a bit complicated. This is actually the very simple version of trying to test for whether the URA actually restores the copyright on the work. Uh, so first you determine, is, is the source country of the work a WTO member or a convention signatory? Uh, there's tables you can look that up on. Uh, is the work copyrightable in the US? Which, you know, sounds like a pretty trivial thing, but that can actually be complicated. For example, architectural works were not protected by U.S. copyright until like 1990 or something. Uh, and for example, like fashion designs may be copyrighted in France, but you can't copyright fashion designs in the U.S. Uh, so there's all sorts of little catches there that are complicated. Um, you also uh, need to know the date of publication. If it was published after January 1st, 1923, then it could have its copyrights restored. If it was before then, then it couldn't. Um, and then you have to determine if the copyright was still in force in the source country on the date of restoration. The date of restoration is usually January 1st, 1996, but it actually depends per country, because uh, different countries join the Berne Convention or other, or the WTO at different years. So that can vary as well. So the simple version is if all of these questions can be answered with a yes, then the copyright was restored, um, and it's still copyrighted in the US, regardless of whether it's copyrighted in the source country. So the, the actual test for your RIA application, though, is actually a lot more complicated than that. Um, and I, I, I kind of came up with this eight-step version, which I think covers most of it. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's a lot more complicated, and there's a lot of things that are very difficult to determine. Uh, so why does this affect commons? Uh, the main reason this affects commons uh, is because the US doesn't observe the rule of the shorter term. Uh, so even though, like normally you would say, like, okay, well, you know, if, these, if, these, if, if the URA is just syncing up copyrights between the US 
and the source country, then you know, for commons, that doesn't matter anyway. Because commons requires that, it, that images and files be public domain both in the source country and in the US. But the actual effect of the URA wasn't so much to sync up the copyrights, but just to grant US copyrights. So they're not necessarily still in sync. Um, and because there's no rule of short term, it could be it could end up being public domain after 1996 in the source country, but then have extended copyrights in the U.S. for who knows how long. Um, another uh, reason why this affects Commons is because um, what, the works whose copyrights expired in the source country after the restoration date. Oh, I already said, never mind. Okay. Uh, oh yeah. So and of course because. Uh, Commons has this policy, then technically we're not supposed to post them on Commons. But a lot of those files are still on Commons. So why are they still on Commons? Well, in most cases, it's actually virtually impossible to determine if the URA actually applies. Um, and the reason for that is because you have to know exactly when the, the image was published. Uh, and you also have to know, was it published in the US within 30 days of being published in the source country? Uh, now for most works you know, that are, have any age whatsoever, little details like that are virtually impossible to find, unless like, you do some really extensive research, go to these archives, and find out these details, which you know, is very difficult to do. Um, secondly, Wikimedia Foundation has never actually received a request to remove a URA file yet. Uh, so there's not really like, a huge pressing need to get rid of all these files immediately even if they might technically be restored by the URA. Um, regardless of that, uploading of new URA files is discouraged. Um, and so they're, they basically just agreed to let, them, let the ones that are on there now stay there for now and not worry about it. Um, but we don't necessarily want to have new ones. Uh, so the result of all this chaos uh, has prompted a lot of people to propose various solutions for how to deal with this. Uh, in fact, there were, I think, four different chapters that actually wrote open letters uh, to the Board of Trustees uh, saying that you know, the foundation should actively figure out how to address this problem. Uh, a lot of people uh, proposed hosting the images outside the US, uh, like setting up either some kind of server somewhere else or setting, you know, having uh, some chapter host them or something like that. Uh, the problem with this solution, though, is that uh, as long as these, as long as where like whatever servers are hosting them are still associated with the Wikimedia Foundation, they're still subject to U.S. jurisdiction. Uh, and the reason is that the Wikimedia Foundation is incorporated in the U.S. It has offices in the U.S. And U.S. courts and a lot of other countries' courts uh, basically interpret that to mean the jurisdiction still applies in the U.S. Even if it also applies in whatever countries the servers are in. Uh, another, a couple other potential issues with that is that. Uh, you potentially lose DMCA protection then because DMCA only, per, only uh, exists in the US. Uh, the DMCA basically says um, as long as you respond to takedown notices, you can't be, the foundation can't be held liable for copyright infringement, which is a really important protection for the foundation. Um, thirdly, you could potentially lose free speech protections. For example, you know, in some other countries, uh, it's illegal to use images of swastikas or images that promote hate speech or things like that. Um, in fact, like you know, most countries have a variety of random laws that can be interpreted in various ways. That in a lot of cases you don't have to deal with in the U.S. because you have First Amendment protections. Uh, finally, the Wikimedia Foundation doesn't actually have that much. Experience experience or expertise in non-US copyright laws. So it would be a big investment as far as time and effort involved in getting up to speed on whatever, wherever else it was hosted, what those laws are, and how they would uh, affect uh, the images, and how they would affect the foundation liability. Um, so another potential solution is just don't do anything. Um, and that's basically what we're doing right now in Commons. Um, and this was effectively what the board recommended to do. Um, and basically, the, the position of the foundation right now in the legal department is that we should just wait for takedown notices for specific files before we take any action. Because in most cases, we can't actually 100% determine if uh, the copyrights were restored. But if we receive takedown notices, those notices will typically include the detailed information that we would need to make a determination about that. Um, and finally, uh, the, uh, an advantage of this solution is that in the meantime, all of those files remain available for reuse. 
So people can go ahead and reuse, they can transcribe the works, the writings of Mahatma Gandhi, a wiki source, um, they can still, you know, listen to audio samples of Sarinsky or whatever. Um, and, you know, as long as we warn people about the potential issues of reusing them, um, it's, it's hopefully a good thing that, you know, these are still out there for people to, to, to utilize and take advantage of. Um, the solution that I would really like to push for, and some other people in comments, would be to try to get the United States to adopt the rule of the short term. Because the entire reason why um, it's so absurd that you know, there are public domain files in the source country that are copyrighted in the US is because the US doesn't follow the rule of the short term. Um, and the, using the rule of the short term is actually suggested by the Berne Convention. So it's, it's not in any way uh, controversial or legally complicated. It's something that is actually expected for the US to do. It's just that when we passed the URIA, for some reason nobody thought to uh, simultaneously adopt the rule of the short term. And the US had never done it before, so nobody really did anything about it. Um, and also, currently, most countries that are burned convention signatories do follow the rule of short term. So there's a lot of precedent for this. Uh, what um, is the rule of short term? And like, what oh, sorry. Um, the rule of the short term basically means um, if you're a country that follows the rule of the short term, then uh, the copyright that you apply to works is either the copyright of the source country or the copyright of that country, whichever is shorter. So for example, if you have a work uh, that has a 50 year copyright term in Guatemala and a 95 year copyright term in the US, um, and the work is 80 years old, then if the, if the US followed the rule of the shorter term, the work would be public domain as well in the US. Um, another advantage of adopting the rule of the shorter term is it keeps the copyrights in sync, so it's less complicated for people to figure out. Right now it's total madness. Like You not only have to understand all the intricacies of the URA and US copyright law, but then you also have to figure out the copyright laws of the source country. Um, so there's only like a handful of people in Commons who are any good at this, and you know they're basically like completely overwhelmed with how much they have to figure out on a daily basis. Um, so what I, what I would really encourage us to do as a movement is to somehow try to lobby the U.S. government, like maybe setting up a, peti a petition on WhiteHouse.org or something like that, uh, maybe like running banners on Commons, um, just to try to like raise awareness about this and try to push for it. Um, and, you know, honestly, like, you know, people always talk about how copyright reform in the U.S. is like a lost cause, it's impossible, there's too many people fighting against it, but you know, getting the U.S. to adopt the short term actually shouldn't be that difficult, um, because there, there's no economic loss for, for, like, any American corporations or authors, because this is, this is only affecting uh, works that are by foreign authors. And in most cases, those foreign authors are not even aware that they still have copyrights active in the US because their works are public domain where they're from. And so a lot of times they don't even know that they have these copyrights. Um, and there's a, lots of potential allies that we could uh, recruit in this push. For example, like most media companies, like even Disney would have something to gain from this uh, because then they can take these works that are public domain in other countries and they can adapt them into their own works. Um, like they can come up with like you know new Alice in Wonderlands or you know things that, that they've they've exploited now that are public domain everywhere. Uh, they would have they would have a larger pool of public domain sources to pull from uh, and create new works without paying huge licensing fees uh, to these uh, authors in foreign countries. Uh, so basically, that's the end of my presentation. And there's a lot more information if you want to learn more about any of these topics like the Berne Convention or the Rule of Short Term on Wikipedia. There's tons of information there. Um, so if you guys have any questions, uh, I think there's not much time. I can try to respond to a few. Yeah. I, I don't know if that was the uh, correction of the <coughs> presentation. I think hundreds of tens of, of, of uh, thousands of tens of thousands of images were, was, were deleted. So reason of your age yeah. that weren't undeleted. Yeah, that, that's in true. Your, in your presentation, you said that uh, we, they are keeping them in Commons and they we can use them, but that's not the case. With, but almost every one of the almost all of those images were Argentinian, I think, or most of them, because the 25 uh, year terms of the photographs. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not exactly like it said in the presentation. 
Yeah, there was there was a period uh, after Dolan versus Holder where uh, most of those images were deleted, and then there was a, a huge discussion about undeleting them. I know that some of them either got undeleted or re-uploaded. Uh, so there are there are like still a, a fair number of URA images on Comet, but you're right, a lot of them have been deleted and are still deleted. Well, what should we do with them? Shall we put them up for uh, re-upload? Uh, that's a good question. I would actually, I think it would be better to actually undelete them uh, because then you have a history of like, you know, the fact that they were uploaded before it was decided that we shouldn't re-upload, we shouldn't upload new URA images. Uh, so I, I think that would probably be less controversial. Okay, but anyhow, I mean, even that, that would go through, I mean, that's not like... I, can't, I cannot speak for the comments community, but yeah. I think there's a decent chance given the discussions that I've had. Yes? I talked to one of your colleagues earlier about this. If you want, you said the first thing a US court would do looking at this, if you did get to something like this, would be to ask, is this fair use in the United States? Is there any chance that the images affected in the Commons could claim a US fair use defense? Uh, yeah, that's that's definitely true in many cases, except uh, on Commons, there, there wouldn't be an actual fair use claim on the file page on Commons. But, but in but, legal terms, yeah, would they be, would it, what, if you look at the four factors, how would they play out? Um, well, I mean, it, it, they could, it could play out, it, it's really unpredictable because it depends on how the case was presented. Like if they're presenting it as to like these files were hosted on commons and they were, they were being advertised for reuse and they, there was no explanation of any kind of fair use at all. Like an image hosted on commons by itself is, would not meet fair use. Um, but if the image is being used on another project, there's usually like a valid fair use argument there. Uh, but you typically, in the case of images hosted on Commons, you're simultaneously hosting them on a separate service for a separate purpose. So it's kind of difficult to argue. Um, but in some cases, I think you could transfer them to other wikis and maybe add fair use claims for them. Was it one of the terms also that it was supposed to have been published in the United States uh, before 1923, before 1924? Uh, well, anything published before 1923 anywhere is public domain anywhere. in the U.S. Anywhere. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So. I think we have to move on. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, um, with uh, sharing uh, images uh, of um, 
monuments of uh, cultural heritage in Italy. And uh, we will talk about uh, two specific uh, projects in which we face uh, these issues, which are uh, Wikilos Monuments uh, and uh, Fagol Project. Uh, Wikilos Monuments, uh, uh, apparently the uh, female were uh, pleased. Uh, anyway, the Wikilos Monuments, uh, all of you know Wikilos Monuments, of course. Uh, it's uh, a fourth contest uh, which uh, consists of uploading uh, pictures of monuments uh, on commons under free licenses. Uh, we wanted to do that in Italy since 2011. Unfortunately, we have uh, a little problem uh, in Italy that uh, the law forbids uh, us to share pictures uh, of monuments. Um, this is not the usual uh, copyright-related uh, uh, freedom of panorama issues, uh, which are uh, that uh, Many monuments uh, are still under the copyright uh, of uh, their, uh, the author, the architect. Uh, um, this is, uh, uh, we don't have freedom of panorama in Italy, but uh, this is not really a problem because nobody cares. <laughs> the real problem, uh, I mean, people don't know that, uh, so you, you won't uh, ever uh, have a problem about this. The problem uh, is uh, bigger than that uh, because we have uh, a law which says that uh, well, a law on the protection of cultural heritage, uh, where protection uh, means that uh, you cannot uh, uh, use the picture of, of, of cultural heritage unless uh, you got an authorization from someone, usually paying. Um, it's, uh, it's of course a problem for us. It's uh, a problem also because uh, often you don't know who you should ask the authorization. Um, it might be the municipality, it might be uh, the owner of the building, it might be uh, the institution which oversees cultural heritage in your area. Uh, who knows? So, oh, it's working now? Yeah. No, it's Sorry. not working. <laughs> it's self no. It's, um, yeah, but the answer is below, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, it, uh, apparently it, uh, it works uh, only when you open it, uh, and uh, thanks for this. I'm just going to reply it on the next slide. Yeah. Okay. So we do it uh, for the next slide. Uh, anyway, what we did, uh, well, uh, yeah. we asked uh, for the authorization to each, uh, to each, for each moment. This is uh, a huge task. Uh, because uh, uh, we had, uh, well, uh, we, the first uh, year we tried to do that, uh, we didn't manage to do because uh, it was uh, too much work. We managed to do that in 2012 uh, also because we had uh, a project manager for this project uh, and uh, her work uh, was uh, mainly to ask authorization. And, uh, oh, these are the results of the first year. Uh, we had uh, approximately 8,000 photos uh, each year, 800 uh, participants, uh, and uh, more important, uh, we got uh, a lot of authorization. Uh, we, in, for 2014, uh, we have now uh, 139 uh, authorization from different institutions. Um, we hope that they will increase uh, in the next month, which means uh, that we have to talk uh, to 10 times that to probably 100 or more institutions. Because of course, uh, it's not that uh, you send an email and you got back uh, uh, an authorization. Uh, this is uh, how we are uh, managing uh, to do this now. Of course, uh, in the long term, uh, what we will uh, be happy to do is uh, to have the law changed. Uh, we are trying uh, we have tried multiple times to uh, push for changes, uh, also uh, in a coalition with other uh, people uh, in Italy and other organizations working on similar topics. Uh, up to now, we have been unsuccessful. Uh, sometimes people talk about this. Uh, we have been recently a law which promised uh, to make uh, sharing pictures free, but uh, it was uh, free on certain condition uh, and for non-commercial purposes, uh, so actually, for Wikipedia and, we, and Commons, uh, who cares? Uh, Wikilos Monuments uh, is the biggest uh, 
project for which we, we faced uh, similar issues, uh, but it's not the only one. Uh, one other one is uh, uh, Eagle, the project of which I talked before. Uh, this is uh, uh, a different uh, kind of project. It's, uh, we are working on uh, epigraphies on uh, inscription uh, of uh, Greek and Latin inscriptions. Um, the point is that uh, uh, scholars uh, in, uh, in the tens and hundreds of years uh, have built uh, different databases uh, of inscription uh, and uh, university have databases of, of inscription uh, but uh, unfortunately they are different. So there is not currently a unified database of, that, of uh, inscription. So this is uh, now WIGOL, which is a European project uh, funded by European and the European Union, uh, which aims to uh, aggregate them and build a unified uh, database which will be part uh, of European. And uh, we are uh, helping uh, this uh, fuse network uh, by uploading these images also on Commons uh, and, uh, uh, more interestingly, to um, also, at, uh, we, we created a wiki based on Wikibase, the same sort of Wikidata, uh, which uh, contains transcription and translation of, uh, um, of uh, the inscription. In, uh, uh, can you go the answer? It's, uh, it's, it's the point is that he, he using crazy, I don't know if, uh, you have that and uh, well, we, can, we can stay on this slide and then Oh, okay. Anyway, we watch the slide. Uh, well, uh, I'm behind that, but still. Uh, um, it's a slide that I wanted to show you now, but I can't. Uh, so it should have been uh, a picture of one of uh, these inscriptions. Of course, that was not an Italian picture, but it was uh, of an inscription which is in Austria, because uh, we have uh, still the same problem. We can take pictures of uh, even inscriptions which are done uh, 2,000 years ago because uh, of the Italian law. Uh, we are trying to work on that, uh, but uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have managed, uh, I, I mean, uh, the network uh, has some uh, agreements uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the state, the ministry. Unfortunately, they have some, some the usual restrictions, uh, like uh, non-commercial use. And uh, now, the, at least the people uh, in uh, the scholars uh, in, uh, which are working on institution uh, are starting to understand uh, that uh, non-commercial clauses, uh, non-commercial restrictions are not good, but uh, there is still much uh, work to do to uh, persuade uh, also the people uh, in, uh, in um, the administration of, uh, of the state uh, that uh, this is the case. Um, uh, so, well, you want me to pass on the document? So now, uh, Pietro will talk uh, a bit about the project also because uh, this is an awesome project, uh, so we can't uh, avoid uh, talking uh, five minutes about that. And uh, the final legal issues uh, that we have, we have uh, faced uh, and uh, how we managed uh, them. What's such a yeah. So, uh, I mean, we just give up on, on trying to show you the presentation, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, the various uh, copyright issues that we had with Eagle were basically uh, related to um, a virtuous process of checking of the contents that we had to aggregate for the main purpose of the Eagle project, which is to give contents to Europeana and to Commons. So, Europeana we give the metadata of the inscriptions that these different databases have and to, uh, to uh, commons we would like to upload as many uh, pictures of the inscriptions uh, as we possibly can, meaning as many as we can uh, give with a public open license. Uh, not many of these actually are, um, have this kind of, uh, of license. So um, in the process of aggregation, we had the opportunity to do a large part of this job of checking all these contents and trying to label them properly according to uh, the uh, Europeana uh, project um, 
suggestions and guidelines for doing this, which uh, became a, um, a very useful uh, part of work for each of the partners in the project to, to understand what the copyrights of their images was. In one case, for example, we could uh, clearly distinguish a part of images um, coming from one project that <coughs> could be uploaded to, to, uh, to Wikimedia Commons, and another part which clearly could not, and uh, which, which wasn't clear at all before. Um, so, uh, the, the, the one thing that we put in place into the context of this aggregation to uh, uh, make it possible for uh, photos that cannot go uh, on commons because of copyright problem is to negotiate um, with the holders of the copyright uh, the releasing uh, uh, with an open license of these uh, um, materials as we did in the case of the Italian uh, Ministry which granted the Eco project permission to publi publish these photos, um, although um, not uh, a permission good enough to publish them also on Commons, and with the Pontificia Commissione di Archeologia Sacra, who also have as an agreement uh, with us to um, make these uh, photos free for publication, which wasn't possible before. Because, um, and um, so uh, why we do this process of enlargement of our network and uh, aggregation of data, we also uh, systematically do a uh, copyright uh, clarification and labeling process, which turns out in clarifying which data we can actually uh, put through to Commons. Uh, and we will hopefully uh, be able to uh, do then a, a big upload of this data uh, via the GLAM uh, toolkit, which was developed by in collaboration with Europeana. And um, yeah, and we hope that that will, will be a, a, a big improvement. But there is also a, a number of images of uh, inscriptions already in Commons, which had the problem of not having um, links to uh, any source that could describe them, or give a transcription, or give a translation. So uh, we had to face a, a little bit of a challenge in finding out what the uh, possibilities of uh, making the uh, Wikimedia in, uh, community interact with the community of the scholars in epigraphy, which have, of course, different point of views, different uh, ways of working. And we ended up setting up a um, um, media wiki which uses Wikibase and built uh, the currently, uh, as far as we know, biggest um, repository of translations of inscriptions, which is actually in our, um, in our uh, media wiki. Uh, using Wikibase uh, allowed us to uh, make it very easy to edit for all these people and um, we could link each and every representation of an inscription in the various databases of uh, inscriptions that there are out there and are part of the project, link images in commons and link images that we uh, upload to commons, plus uh, to be able to easily retrieve uh, information that we can use for categorization in commons and therefore improve also the content in commons, sorry. For example, by adding um, CIL and uh, native graphic categories which were already partially there. Uh, so uh, this turned out to be a, a mutually beneficial process, which means also that uh, uh, the outcome of this, uh, we hope it's something that will uh, um, be a very good point to convince uh, people that uh, might uh, give us rights to publish these images to comment also for it, for example, uh, to allow us to do that and to probably uh, allow this to happen also for a larger groups of interest than possibly for everything. Um, so we think it's um, um, a profitious work that has been done not just for aggregating and putting the data together but also as a way to show what are the possibilities and why that should be uh, that should be done with, uh, with the proper um, open answers. Uh, it was a bit difficult to explain this uh, without the, <laughs> the slides, but uh, um, anything that uh, hasn't been clear, we've got uh, plenty of ten minutes uh, to discuss and uh, go more and more. Oh, really just just something like yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you can fix this problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah just break. finish the story. <laughs> 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 but, but it's you know, a very long building. Yeah, <laughs> I think at, at this point it's uh, okay. well, uh, your secondary, your second screen resolution no. is no. yeah. Okay, yeah. let's uh, let's yeah. see if you can roll 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 roll
copyright for ancient monuments in Italy? Uh, you said no one owns the copyright, of course, yeah. but uh, uh, there are restrictions which, which goes uh, beyond copyright. I mean, you don't have uh, only copyright restrictions. There are a lot of other restrictions, mm -hmm. like uh, for pictures of people, uh, you have personality rights. Yes. For uh, uh, Nazi symbols, uh, you have my have a restriction in Germany, so and so on. In Italy, you have restrictions uh, on uh, the, uh, on cultural heritage, uh, on uh, anything which can be considered a cultural heritage. Uh, who uh, has the right to give authorization? Uh, it's not always clear. Uh, it is uh, usually at uh, the owner of the, of the object or the, um, the organization which uh, uh, oversees the um, cultural heritage on the area. Superintendence are called uh, in Italy. I don't know what could be an English translation. One of the problems, or maybe it may be the church, if you have, uh, if it's uh, a religious, um, a religious building. Um, in fact, it's like sorry. Uh, I, I'm, I'm he's uh, one another, of, the, of, another of the people which are working uh, on Tegel project. Yeah. So basically, the fact is that probably a monument could be. Uh, uh, could be owned by the municipality, the province, the region, the, the state, or a superintendent, or the church, or a private, we don't know. So we are actually, the, the first task is to identify who actually owns the monument and then asking them for, uh, for permission and then lighting uh, a candle to a saint in order to obtain that. Uh, <laughs> 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 Can you make it a bit uh, clearer? Why is it, if we can take a simple case, maybe the Tower of Pisa, something like this, is it something we can put in comments, a picture of this tower? The or Tower of Pisa? Is it portrayed in, in, in Italian or worldwide? There is a picture of uh, the little tower of Pisa in commons because uh, commons has a policy, policy which more or less says uh, we care only of copyright. If there are restrictions which are not uh, related to copyright uh, and which are not uh, valid in the US, uh, we don't care. So it's on so it's on commons. Uh, so it uh, might be a not uh, say uh, uh, something saying uh, hey a disclaimer saying uh, uh, there, is, uh, there are restrictions on these images, uh, these images, uh, but uh, it, might, it can be on commons. Of course, uh, when we are organizing it uh, as uh, with Media Italy. We can say, okay, there is a law which forbids you to do that, but uh, who cares? Uh, commons, uh, it's not a problem for commons, okay? Because uh, I mean, we have uh, we have to follow the, the Italian law, and moreover, uh, we want uh, to uh, stress that there is a problem. Okay, but practically, um, the picture can appear on Wikipedia English, but not on Wikipedia Italian. Uh, Technically, there is no difference because anything is hosted, on, uh, hosted in the US. Uh -huh. In practice, uh, in, on uh, Italian Wikipedia, we put up a lot uh, more, more care on that. And uh, uh, also because uh, there, uh, we, have, we have had problems on this uh, in, uh, in the past. For example, one of the, of the first cases, I think in 2008, was uh, uh, from uh, the city of Florence. Okay. When we were asked uh, to remove uh, everything about museums in Florence okay. on Wikipedia, and uh, okay, it was a bit of a problem. We we managed uh, to to have an agreement uh, on this. That, uh, okay. It can happen. Okay. And actually, for the for the Wiki of monuments, um, for, for every year, for all the photos that are taken between in, in the framework of Wiki of monuments, we have to apply another template. That explicitly says that those images are there for an authorization by the Ministry of Cultural Heritage, which allows only study, uh, sorry, uh, something related to studying or uh, uh, not commercial reuse at all, and uh, uh, possibly just research purposes, uh, but not commercial purposes. So we have to to, to state it clear. Um, there was a question about this new. Ask for, a, for an authorization. 
that's the fact that the ministry can do whatever it wants with, the, with uh, its own images, but you can't. Of course, if you do that, the ministry will never prosecute you, but technically you can't. That's, that, that's the, the stupid thing about it. Uh, not, uh, maybe maybe you don't know that, but just out of curiosity, why this law has been, I mean, what what would the... Uh, What's the benefit? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, there are mainly two aspects of that. One is that, that this law has been uh, written not with uh, uh, internet sharing in mind. They had a lot of uh, different uh, of different things in mind. It's uh, actually a long law, and this is only part of it. Uh, they were talking uh, also of restrictions about uh, reproduction, like uh, um, when you you make uh, a physical uh, copy. No, physical copy. And, uh, anyway. And the third thing uh, is uh, that uh, you uh, usually have to pay money to get an authorization. So uh, many uh, institutions think that they can uh, make money out of that. Actually, it doesn't work because uh, it's negligible and you have a lot of overhead for doing that uh, and uh, it's uh, economically pointless. But uh, it's, uh, some, it's something that they don't want to give up. Yeah. Yeah. We, in uh, UK you won't have any problem. Of course, in theory, when you came back uh, to Italy, you could have uh, uh, I don't know, a fine or, uh, or what else. But uh, uh, while on copyright you have uh, international treaties uh, that uh, um, harmonize it uh, on, uh, on an international level uh, for these laws, uh, there is nothing like that. Yeah. <laughs> so probably, uh, just to be a, a bit more clear, uh, the, the idea of uh, the Ministry of Cultural Heritage is to protect the cultural heritage, of course. And we have lots of monuments and uh, um, art, uh, art pieces that are scattered all around the world, and the Ministry is doing a really great job in taking them back. Or to, really, uh, to uh, uh, have uh, some sort of agreements with museums for only illegally exporting art pieces. The other side is that, unfortunately, they say to the, to the state agencies, just you are on your own. So you have to uh, commercially use what you have because there is no money and we are not going to give you anything. You, have, you are just on your own. You just have to work your own way. So this is just the, 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 the other part of the law, which is completely bonkers, but I know, but uh, still, it, 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 it's stupid because uh, as Laurentiu said, uh, they can't make any money, actually. Even the Uffizi, even the, the uh, all the main museums are in, are in a loss at the moment because they can't, you know, uh, make too many publicity about, about it. And, and there, is, there are so many restrictions about photographs so that they can't, they can't be reused. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, okay. Sorry, by the way, uh, Luca Martinelli, um, sorry for jumping in and, uh, in the Q&A session. <laughs> right. okay. yeah. 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 Even there are centralized database of what is allowed, like the Wikimedia Foundation is, is one of the, the, the groups which are interested in sharing this uh, footprint. So there are probably other institutions in Italy. So, have you found the emerging artifacts and uh, make a list of who owns the right or what and what which monuments? Ah, this is what we have actually. Was there is also a bigger, uh, another problem yeah. with, with those monuments. Uh, in fact, uh, usually what you do with those monuments is that uh, you take a, li a list of the monuments in a country, you do all the organizational stuff and say, okay, people uh, go and um, take pictures of uh, these monuments. Uh, in Italy, there is no list uh, of monuments. Uh, and uh, there are no partial well, list of uh, monuments, no, is no, well. no official list of monuments, and if there is something, th they won't give it to you. They, uh, people uh, in the public administration don't want you to know who, who 
which are the monuments in Italy. There is no official list of protected monuments. There is no official list of protected monuments. There are some list of some monuments, but you can't have access to them. Mm -hmm. And of course, yeah, of course they may have the list, it's yeah. just the list of the monuments they own. Yeah. They have a, it's not the whole, the whole list of monuments yeah. in a city. Yeah. Sorry, another question from that? Well, actually, I don't know why. I mean, it's not But I, I think that actually sharing images. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, because uh, I mean, uh, there are 60 million of people, uh, you are, we will have uh, at least a couple of million of people uh, which share images, uh, you can't go and find all of them. So, there are, there are uh, these cases, are the sec there are only a small number of cases uh, which are uh, being uh, actually prosecuted, uh, because, uh, I mean, it's uh, un unenforceable as a law, clearly. But he's a, he's a professor in university. And uh, yeah. by the way, please give uh, he's just, uh, a point of advantage because uh, if uh, you can, uh, there is an exception for uh, uh, studying purposes. So if you are a professor, then the, you are using it for the, for the education <laughs> reason or, or similar, you can say, you could say, okay, I'm allowed to do that because there is an exception. Yeah, and it but should be, uh, it should be a low resolution image. Oh, no, be low, very low high resolution. resolution. In general, the reason is uh, uh, you can't, uh, there is no strict enforcement of this. Uh, but sometimes uh, there is enforcement, uh, like uh, in the case uh, I said before when we were uh, contacted by the uh, Florence uh, Museum. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, Actually, 
what I want to share with one of the comments uh, is that uh, it took me about three days just to scan those, uh, they seem to go over 9,000 times, uh, 500 days. It's quite what's made to take the depth of the other job. Uh, is there anyone who doesn't know what the resource is? Well, yeah, I mean, if you don't know, you can go to Wikipedia, I think. But uh, in short, it's a digital library uh, where we mix both public domain text and also other free text, which are not subject of copyright. Uh, it started in 2003, and now there are six main languages and there are four million entries. Um, entry can be like a huge book or it can be a short poem. Uh, that's how things in the source are found. Uh, so, uh, if you want to put some kind of book on each source, uh, there is basically two ways to start with. Uh, you can look for a book which, which is already digitized and scanned. Uh, for example, on Google Books, there are a lot of ready processed books you can start taking with. Or, uh, which will uh, be the most case, especially if you are not in the English speaking country, uh, you will need to take the book and scan it yourself. Uh, so, uh, I think most of the people know what megapixels are in Paris nowadays. And when we speak about uh, resolution of a print or scan, there is another measurement unit called dots per inch. And uh, the best, the golden number for text you want, for image you want to get text out of, is uh, 300 dpi. Uh, that's the most optimal one. It's Enough of it, and uh, images are not so big as uh, they will become in the world as higher amount. But uh, actually, if you can pull out more, uh, more higher resolution uh, without sacrificing some like, a lot of time, uh, some software recommended to try the 400 or even 600. Uh, they say that the quality will be higher. And uh, because uh, if we have just a plain sheet of paper, uh, it's straight and it's easy to scan, but when we are looking for groups, uh, you're writing uh, we have this curve. And that's one of the most uh, big problems when you try to scan a group. And uh, also, uh, it's especially true if you try to use a camera just to make photos, uh, you need the book to be the only way. And uh, that's a special case with Google Books, they usually use only black and white one across pictures. But actually, you can get a uh, gray scale or in color version to also help you do it with here and you'll get a higher quality of text recognition. So, uh, just uh, I'll go through the most common types of scanners uh, that you can use for digitizing the book. Uh, this is a flatbed scanner. I think everyone is seen it if not use it. It quite looks like a copying, copying machine. It is pretty good. Uh, put a sheet of something, close the cover, and scan it. Uh, they are cheap, they are everywhere, but the problem with them and the book is that some binding goes out and creates distortions, which uh, makes things quite hard. And uh, there is another option. Uh, actually, this is the very scanner I use to scan those groups. Uh, so uh, you can see them on flatbed scanners, and you will see them in the office machines, uh, things which are called multifunctional devices, such so as scanner, copper machine, printer, fax, etc. But uh, as you see, it has somewhere up, it has space to put in, like, lots of uh, pack of papers. But uh, what it means uh, in terms of scanning the book is that we need to destroy the book. We need to combine it, uh, cut the pages. Uh, then you get a very high speed, uh, quite good quality. Uh, you don't need to put so much manual effort on it, but the book gets destroyed. So uh, it's, it's kind of a matter of personal decision if, if you are ready to destroy the book. Force it or not, but if it's some unique group, you definitely don't want to cut it bit by pieces. But if you can, it actually makes things quite quite fast and you get good quality out of it. Uh, another 
that we've gone over, uh, which, rule, uh, which actually uses the same risk, but it looks like pre inverted with the type of edges and a full scanning. As a dog computer scanner, uh, the main difference between ADF and, and those is that uh, this type of scanners usually have sensors from both sides. So uh, it makes things twice as possible. So if the page goes down one time, you have both sides of so your book. And uh, usually uh, books are not so high, so if you rotate the page, so you don't scan it by length, but by width, uh, then it will become even more faster. And, the, and then you just rotate the images back in the book. Also, allow you to save a lot of time. Uh, if you don't have any devices around, you can use point and shoot camera or smartphone. Uh, again, like if you are going to scan this long book, this is maybe something to start with, but it's probably the worst solution. It's not most affordable. You already have a camera or you have a smartphone with a secure camera, but uh, there are issues, especially with German 12 page, German 12 scan, or resolution. And if you are doing this, make sure you at least put some lamps around the book so you get uh, it very well lit and not much noise. Uh, those are like hand scanners. Uh, the main <coughs> is they are portable uh, and they are cheap. They start from around $50. Uh, the fact that they are portable means they can throw them in bag and then go to some library which doesn't let you take out the book. That's kind of place. They won't ask too much questions. Uh, but the big disadvantage of it is that you are moving it by your hand. So it takes quite a lot of skills to be able to move it evenly without getting distortion. So it's, it's worth doing it only if you want this kind of book which you can take out of library and put it some kind of library. And this is probably uh, one of the best solutions uh, you can do if you are serious about scanning books. Uh, this is called Do It Yourself Book Scanner. It's open source. Uh, there are different applications. Uh, it's based on the scanner which Internet Archive was using for digitizing books. Uh, price for creating it will range from like $200 to $500, depending on like, what materials you use. Uh, how you write it, in what part of book you use. But uh, you don't destroy a book here. Uh, you, go to, uh, you, you get very good quality. So uh, how it works? I'm sorry for this. Some of the flaws, I think. Like, do you hear me now? OK. So uh, how to use this is, uh, so here it has two cameras, two identical cameras. And I said you have a lamp, and you place the book down, so like here down, and there's a special thing you can pull, and your book goes up to this glass plate. So it, it gets straight under glass, there is no uh, geometrical distortion. Uh, you get quite good quality from uh, cameras, and it's actually really fast. Uh, the only thing is you need to stand by and flip every page by your hand. But taking that you don't destroy the book, I think it's worse. And another problem is it's, it's quite big. Something like that, so you need some space to keep it. If you are a budget, you can find funding. Uh, like, so there are some like, overhead or planetary scanners. Actually, uh, this one is not exactly planetary, but I was not able to find a free feature planetary scanner. I think Fujis has something for around $800 and it promises that you just put the book under it and flip the pages and that's all you need to do to scan the book and it will even automatically detect how you flip the pages. <coughs> so it promises a good quality, a uh, fast speed uh, and like uh, it, it, it costs $800. Uh, I think the Wikimedia chapter of Sweden had one so you may ask their team before you try to get one because <coughs> when I saw reviews, people were saying that it's not good for scanning books because, again, the binding problem, they promise to solve it, but they don't solve it so good. And, uh, yeah, there is another interesting solution, uh, which is, again, you can do it yourself. It's in open source. It was created by people who work for Google. <coughs> it's their free time, uh, but it is it's more like technically advanced version and it's not so easy to be yourself unless you are really good at 
reviewing your self skills. So uh, it uses a uh, vacuum pump. I'll try to speak loudly here. So uh, they put uh, they open the group, they sit here, and there's motor that takes the group back and forth. And as there is some vacuum pump to take the, the air, it will automatically flip the page. So basically, all the manual operation you need to do is just open the group, uh, put it on cradle, and press the button. It will go through, and it will flip the pages, and somewhere here they use sensors from scanners. So, uh, if you're serious about and if you can get help of people, some like leaders or something, <coughs> something to try to build, but I, I don't think uh, like one person can do it. Yeah, but I'm not sure it's worth that. And there are like professional book scanners, there are like different models, uh, they can work with like very delicately with groups, uh, but they usually cost like some five, six digits. So I don't seem to apply it, but maybe you can find it in some library or music nearby and can arrange that you come, be in that group, and that will let you know. Because I will have some experience like that, uh, dealing with the library, which will allow us to use it professionally. So there's some comparison chart. Probably it's, it's not the best one to look at screen, but I will put those. Uh, Slides and comments, so it can look so later. So if you ask me, is a, like, from probably the most popular folder, and those things for which source will be either to use ADF or document computer scanner and destroy the book, or try to build the do it yourself book scanner. And, uh, all the charts and design are there. And a uh, few words on taking book apart. Uh, if it's just soft cover and it's glued, there's not much you can do. You just cut it with a cutter and then you use a guillotine, which I showed you here. But, uh, if it's an um, older book, uh, you better separate. Uh, they are kind of divided in packs. So first you try to take a knife and separate those edges, and only then you use guillotine. Uh, that way you get much better edges. And the better are the edges, the higher will be result, because otherwise printers tend to take two or three pages at a time instead of one, and you get missed pages, and you have constantly control the process, which isn't as fun as it seems. Uh, after you've scanned, uh, there are some ways to improve the image, and it helps a lot. Uh, there's like wonderful applications, can tailor it's open source, it has uh, versions for Windows and Linux, maybe Macos, I'm not sure. It will allow you to uh, fix rotation. Uh, like that's especially useful when you use camera to shoot things. Uh, it will allow you to split pages if you, for example, using camera or using flatbed. Uh, you can take two pages at a time. It will allow you to split pages, do this to them. Uh, it will rotation in this new process it will automatically find the content for you and it will allow you to uh, put new margins. So in the end, uh, like here you see the original scan page and this is after it was processed. Uh, actually the original isn't the worst uh, that I've seen. I just didn't find a better case but like it really does a really good job at improving images. Here's just another version. And now, uh, after you scan and process your images, uh, the next step is to convert them from uh, just image data to a text, which, which is useful, which can be uh, copy pasted, searched, categorized, etc., etc. So uh, I think one of the 
Europe. Uh, it doesn't support so many languages. I've seen as Russian, Ukrainian, and English. Uh, but it got open source about a few years ago. Uh, when I was working with the presentation, the website was done. So I'm not sure how live the project is, but it was like, back in five years, there were seven sites. So for example, it was really nice. And if not, or if your language is not supporting my reader, uh, which is, for example, the case even for major languages like Farsi, uh, then there is a last solution, which is open source solution developed by HP back in 20 years ago. Uh, then they passed it to Google. So it's more of uh, another ready solution of the box by Tosiar and Jan, but there are a lot of activities you can train your language from sketch. If you're working with language for which there is no CR solution, uh, try to train the Tosiar app, it's totally worth it. You will solve a big problem for your language speakers. It's not just about the service. And uh, I also want to share some mistakes and uh, potential issues. So uh, when you scan a multi-column text, uh, we will find an item that will not notice columns like you can see here. It will seem that the column is two columns for one, so you need to uh, be careful when you select text areas. Or as here, it can somehow split between the columns that in different lines. Of course, if you don't fix this, you will get a garbage or and it's quite hard to mix it in with the source. And uh, another issue which will uh, quite often happen is that it will uh, miss the order of text areas, so it will go back and forth. <coughs> uh, if you are scanning a small uh, like fiction book which just has one area of text, you won't have that problem. But like, if you are scanning newspapers or dictionaries or encyclopedias, uh, it took quite some time to fix every text area. And uh, actually, I think we are short on time, so question how many did contribute to British service before I go to basics? Okay, so then, then I go to basics. Uh, I assume that everyone contributed to Wikipedia. So here is a short comparison chart between, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of wide to be the source for Wikipedia. So uh, if we are on Wikipedia, we talk about articles, we talk about works. Uh, like other things you can read, but uh, what I'd like to put your attention is that uh, the source has three additional namespaces. It's called Author, and a special page where we can uh, create some short view about Author and put all the words of him that I want to collect. There is an uh, index page, that I'll show you later, and there is a page for every scanned page of the book. And there is a translation on uh, those wiki sources which allow user generated translations. That's not the case with every source, but some allow it. So, uh, this is how the wiki source in this page looks. Uh, you have the general information of our book, you have content, and in this. Oops, sorry. And uh, in this area, you have all the list of pages. Uh, on this screenshot, you see that all of them are green, it means that they are great times by different users and they are uh, with quite high quality. If not, uh, they will be red and I will hopefully show you. And how we did this is actually no fancy wiki like text with markup required. Uh, there's just some kind of form we give in the fields. You say where it takes images, you, you set some basic information about book, also published date, etc. So much for namespace page, and if we if we go to uh, it is a page namespace. Uh, there's a workflow extension uh, which allows really to the stuff. Uh, so on one side you get scan image, and on the other side you get text. So you can compare them, find the mistakes, and uh, actually this is one of the like most things I like about the source that we don't only provide the text version, we also provide them with original images. So you can make sure that uh, uh, the text is not modified, you can see the original book, and it matters a lot because uh, a lot of libraries provide only images and you can do the text, or they provide only text and you can check the original image. So, uh, this is a more detailed step 
step-by-step-wise of what you need to do. And I think I'm kind of over, so questions or suggestions?
present and to talk about this, and so I initially didn't even plan to talk about, I wanted to talk first, of course, uh, about this scanner, I think it's one of the best solutions. Then I saw that there will be like a special presentation about me, but it got cancelled. But if you can find some quotes from Wikimedia uh, chapter Argentine, just contact them, because they have good experience, and I think it's the best option. If, if you have more money, yeah, just use a Google Play or scan. Sure. Has anyone done this for Wiktionary on the large scale? Because I do the same kind of work mm -hmm. as you do, but I do it with very rare dictionaries of minority languages, mm -hmm. as well as wordless manuscripts and so on. So, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I haven't tried it to make it for Wiktionary, but uh, as like dictionary structure and encyclopedia structure is kind of similar. You have like lots of entries on one page. Uh, actually, I'm working now on a tool for source which will allow you to like, create a lot of small entries for one page. For example, for dictionary it's perfect. Because uh, Wikisource has a good mechanism of uh, separating different like, pieces from one page and using them later. Uh, this is probably like again specific topic uh, level. Let's talk about this later. Yeah, so okay, it's yeah. Less conversation I will show you a few things. Okay, great. Yeah. You have can, you can, but uh, like if it's a dozen of pages, it's some small brochure or like a one newspaper, uh, maybe it will be faster. But if you are scanning the book with hundreds of pages, it will just take a lot of time to upload JPEGs individually, then to the list of those JPEGs, then manually transfer the text, etc. So uh, trying to just learn it once how to make the digital file and save a lot of time. Uh, it's it's open source solution. Like for formats, there are like a lot of tools to create a review for. You don't need to every five readers to do for that. Uh, I still don't understand uh, the advantage of uploading uh, the digital file mm -hmm. or from uploading only text. Mm -hmm. Only for text, yeah. Only for text, you can just put it in one big text file and use a bot to upload it. But again, I think the main point for many sources to have both image and text. <coughs> Some many sources, I think, even uh, don't allow you to upload all the text. Some will, some will translate it or <coughs> to do something like that. Uh, yeah, if it's only text, then you don't need to put it together in search now. Um, yeah. If, if, if you have like individual, let's say you have a page, and you have a book and it's 200 pages, uh -huh. but you, you're particularly interested in one chapter of that book, so mm -hmm. you just do that one chapter in photographs. Mm -hmm. Let's say then a couple of years later you go ahead and do another chapter. Is there a way to build a Deja Vu file from the individual photos? Um, Can you do it backwards? Can you do it like stepwise, the way you normally do a Wikipedia and little bits build an article from stuff? Well, with separate JPEGs, it should be totally possible with page view. I'm not sure. The thing is that like one page view will contain from like page something to page something, and another one from page one to page fifteen, etc. I'm not sure if you can tell the view that like the first page of your file is not actually the first page. It's like I noticed that. I was so uh, I should look into format, but like it may be tricky one. Well. But uh, worst case scenario, you can just merge them later. So oh, like if, you want, if you want to start with chapter, start with single chapter, and then one single something. It's wiki, it's easy to fix everything. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And okay. like if you have questions or if you want to see the slideshow, I'll put a link to it on my head.